Last week we did a lot of talking on forms and basic physics underneath fabrics and you can see how considering last week's lesson how everything is pretty much unified when it comes to the rules of physics. Things cast a shadow, the rules of cast shadows are the same between any kind of object. Objects that have um, faces facing the light get the most contrast, get the light source on them. You have beautiful balance between midtones and highlights and dark tones. Never use blacks or whites. These rules are consistent. I'm sorry, I'm a, I need a cough break. These rules are consistent um, throughout any kind of medium that you're drawing. And if you see the basic light behavior in anything in your references, in any object that you find in your references, uh, you'll be able to break that object down and then recreate it in your canvas. Remember though, I know I repeat this a lot, but because I don't know, you know who's watched all my videos or not, but remember that when you paint, you're missing a third dimension. You're missing the third dimension of the craft. Um, when you're a sculptor, all you have to do is carve away at the, at, the, at, the, at the marble and then the light is cast on there for you. Um, so that means, you know, the world renders it for you. The world renders the shadows, but you as the artist have to know how those shadows are rendered. And that's why drawing is so hard, because we forget to make light the, the, the diva. We, we forget to make light the focus of our attention. We forget to learn the basic physics, basic physics of the light, and we think art is a matter of memorizing how to draw something, uh, or memorizing how to, to, to make something look nice, or... Um, I think I think that's that's the biggest problem. If anyone were to ask me, uh, what's the biggest problem artists face today? What should I be working on? What should I be looking out for? It's definitely the fact that we don't put light first. We don't put the light of something first, and we don't have a vocabulary for it. We don't have a anywhere in our brain with a little file folder of light phenomenon. And that's my mission statement. That's what I'm out to do. I'm out to teach you guys the vocabulary of your craft, and the vocabulary of art starts with light. Um, so, uh, really good practice to get your brain to constantly think about it. Um, I try to think about form constantly now. Even if I see other people's art, I'll try and critique it based on things I learn here. So I can remember these things when I'm painting on my own. Beautiful job. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will. I promise I'll, I'll, I'll take rest. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take pauses when I need it. I promise. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, just because I've put myself as the teacher does not mean that I haven't been learning as I taught you guys. A lot of the stuff that I know, a lot of the things that I do, for instance, the 14-day challenge, the form studies, a lot of the methods I use in private tutoring, a lot of the core words that I use, the, the, the core discourse and the vocabulary are all because I taught. So just because you're in a teaching position doesn't mean that you've forfeited the student position. If you guys give each other critiques, which I encourage 100%, you will be placed in a position where you are repeating it to yourself as much as you're repeating it to other people. So this means that you'll be speeding up your learning process even further and exponentially even. So uh, please do engage in the critiques um, as much as possible. Take, take Shauna's example and uh, you'll learn much more. You'll remember things better and you'll see it as a form of proof. You know, there's always me telling you guys how to do stuff and then there's, you know, everyone has that little stubbornness inside and that's okay. The person who wants answers, that's in everyone. And you guys are going to ask questions. You guys are going to want me to prove it. This is why the before and after is so uh, core in my teaching method. I want to prove to you. I want to give you proof. I'm not just going to sit here talking and talking. And just, you, you just believe me blindly. So um, uh, make sure that you're always asking questions and you're engaging in some sort of dialogue so that you can prove it to yourself as well. There's, you know, there's me and then there's the inner battle with yourself <clears throat> as you learn. So that's a mini intro. I'm not sure why I did that. <laughs> but let's, let's go on to this. This person tried to redo, very successfully, not tried, did, redid the, um, the, uh, the critique, uh, the lesson that I did uh, last week or last Tuesday, um, last class. And, uh, and I think they did an amazing job. They did, however, write that they were having trouble. I don't know. They'll never use white in its fullest ever, ever. They did write about how they were having trouble um, bringing in the secondary light source. So the first and foremost thing that comes before secondary light source is diffusing the shadows. These shadows need to be diffused first. We are having a cast shadow. This is the, this is the zone of the cast shadow right here. Object A. 
object B. Yes, object A moves inward, that doesn't matter. It's still part of it is in front of object B. Object A is casting its shadow just along here. This shadow inherits the shape of object A. So cast shadows, everyone write this back to me, inherit the shape of the object casting them. If it's a triangle, the cast shadow will be triangle. If it's a square, the cast shadow will be square. However distorted because of the placement on object B, it can take the shape of object B. So if you've got like a triangle casting a shadow on a circle, it's not going to cast a shadow like this. That's impossible. Um, what it will do is follow the contours of the object um, on which it is cast. So it will take the shape of triangle of, of the object A, but it will um, adhere to the contours of object B. This is a very massive pillar rule um, that you guys need to remember because if, if you don't know how to behave with your cast shadows, the cast shadows will not be doing it for you. The cast shadows are like cocaine for artists. Um, they're amazing. They're, they are what move me as an artist personally. Um, cocaine. I don't know why I chose that drug. I have like no f dialogue with drugs at all. I, I don't understand anything about drugs. I don't know what cocaine is, the difference between cocaine and meth. But, <laughs> but I chose cocaine, so let's go with it. Um, don't do drugs, kids. Do not do drugs. Do art. <clears throat> but, um, what the fuck was I saying? I completely <laughs> lost my train of thought. But yes, if you don't know how to behave with your cast shadows, you won't be able to um, really use them to, their, to, the, to, to the ultimate. They won't really um, dress up your painting like you want them to. So this is one of the most basic rules um, of cast shadows. Cast shadows inherit the shape of the object casting it. Cast shadows in a cube. I can definitely, I could be eating noodles and I will suddenly think to myself, the cube. <laughs> Don't do drugs, do art. <laughs> I already called the cops. It's a GG. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but there are some great artists um, that did drugs. Uh, no, <laughs> um, I, I don't think that's uh, that's good. I think that, I don't think that's good. There's an amazing uh, quote from a teacher who who ran a creative writing class, and he said that he had a bunch of students who did marijuana and he said that people think marijuana is the fuel for creativity they're wrong it actually dulls your creativity it gives you the high that you need and satisfies the high leaving art as a secondary high and what what can compare to marijuana what can compare to an actual um, drug that distorts your thinking and, and fries your brain so um, and fries your thinking and destroys all cognition and all of that. So what happens is that he said, I, I miss my students. I miss the way they used to write before they were high. I'd rather my students get high off creativity. So I'm throwing that in there in case anybody decides to think that you can get better art with drugs. It's not true. Anyways, back to this. You need to defuse your core shadow. Um, so object A is in front of object B. You did good with the shape of the, of the cast shadow, but it does not look um, appropriate to the, to, the, to the surface. Remember, object B is we the cast shadow and object B everyone listen to this part object B the, cat, the object on which the cat, the shadow is being cast did you see that B object B um, the shadow adheres not only to its contours but to its value as well so if this is a white object what will happen to the cast shadow is it will go up in value so this is why this didn't look right because you have this value and this value really neighboring really close to each other even though this is an indentation, a deep contour, a valley of valleys, and this is an elevation, how can they possibly share the same value? That is not right. So what needs to happen is you need to defuse this shadow to respect the realm in w on, which it, um, on which it hovers. That means that object B's cast shadow, the, uh, the cast shadow on object B needs to follow object B's rules. So it's like an immigrant. All right, you have an immigrant that came from Turkey and is going to Greece for God knows why, and um, and the immigrant, yeah, okay, he's 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 from <laughs> Turkey. Let's inverse this. Let's say he's from Greece and he's going to Turkey. It makes more sense. Um, he's going. He's okay, right? So then, G Turkey has rules. All right, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done, you guys. I'm. I promise, it's over. It's over. So for everyone breathe. All right, so um, I'm just going to defuse this shadow. 
And I'm going to make sure that the shadow stays sharper and darker the closer it gets to the most immediate uh, axis. So let's look back at these at these um, A and B. Let's say A is... <laughs> I'm afraid of reading the chat right now. <laughs> um, let's say A is a triangle. All right, everyone with me? Let's say A is a triangle, and this is the ground on which it stands, and this is the z-axis. It's basically just, um, it's looking in, it's going inward, there's depth. There's this part is closer than this part. This part is closer to us than this part, all right? And then there's object B, which is the circle, all right? Um, this bit is closer to this than this, correct? Everyone with me? This means that the sh cast shadow caused by this end is going to look sharper than the cast shadow caused by this end, which is going to look much softer. So it doesn't matter that it's the same object. Cast shadows, the rule is still consistent. Even if it's within the same object, caused by the same object, object A has different depth levels. How into the z-axis and how close it is to object B determines how sharp the cast shadow is. Now, I'm not going to ask you to write that back at me because that's too long. But basically, the distance, uh, the factors of... Um, just always, try to, always remember that the closer the object is to the to this object casting it, the closer it is to the light. Um, to the light, uh, the, the sharper the shadow. So there's two instances the, sh the, the shadow can be sharp. Closeness between the two objects and the light's intensity and closeness. Or light's intensity is closeness as well. If the light was back here, this entire shadow's potential is decreased. It gets, it gets fuzzy right off. Lots of rules. I, I really hope you guys remember in these. They're really technical. So this means what I'm trying to do here is... I deleted everything. Um, is I'm trying to sharpen the shadow of that bulge to be sharper than this edge here. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some of this highlight and push it in. Damn it. Okay. And this shadow here will get less and less sharp the lower we go, so I'm pretty much using soft brush to my advantage here. Like I said, they're very gradual things. Um, fabric has that. You need to find a good brush for that. A brush that will make you pedal forward instead of, you know, for every two steps forward you take three steps back because of the texture in it. Find a brush that will only help you go forward. Alright, so it's a small change, but it's the biggest difference to the trained eye. Alright, so it makes a very, very big difference on the quality of object B, on the texture of object B, on the altitude of object B in comparison to object A. It makes a very big difference. And it's in the particulars that you find improvement if you're advanced already. If you're advanced, it's going to be very hard for you to improve. I'm just letting you know, there's going to be a time where you stop improving because that's how slow you're improving. It feels like you've stopped. At that, at that moment in time when you are like advanced or um, you know, you're, you're 10 years into your craft and you say, holy crap, you know, I don't know what to do next. My art has come to a standstill. It's in the details. It's in the details where you find the thing that you need to start doing. It's in the particulars. So look out for these as you're, as you're training here. Even though you might be a, an intermediate or, or beginner with art, I don't like these labels, but I have to use them for the sake of a, a lesson. But um, even if you are a beginner, look out for them. Think about them. You might not be thinking about them just yet because you're still trying to deal with core shadows and making things make sense just, just on a basic elementary level. But still, look out for them anyway. Makes all the difference, in my opinion, anyways. All right, there needs to be cleaner edges. They're, they're, they have to be clean. We're trying to represent a texture. This is something I asked you guys to repeat back at me last, uh, last class. The texture, the edge of the object um, translates its texture as well. So this, the edge work, the, the work you put into the edge is like putting work into, the, into rendering. Yeah, it's a small little cleanup job, but it makes the biggest difference. 
and how the, the, the object behaves when it comes to the edge. The edge is another way to measure, measure an object's behavior, how it looks like on, on the cross-section. So uh, this is what we need to start doing and start rendering and thinking about how objects sit as edges. Um, let me do something a little interesting. Oops. <clears throat> so we can see exactly how these uh, these materials are overlapping on each other. Is that good? It's very very thin material, apparently. <clears throat> right, merge down. Okay. Really? That's all you can give me, magic eraser brush? Ugh, all right. Let's just see what we can do with this. All right, so I've basically made a cross-section. So I'm trying to explain what I was talking about earlier. I've made a cross-section of, of what I'm trying to show you here. So I've cut off the top kind of just slit right slit right through cut it right through um, just to show you how the edge or how these objects are overlapping each other at this time so the light will most likely hit this side clean that up this edge and this edge are sharing a value they're both the laser coming out of them is both facing the same direction. I'll zoom out in a second. This is dangerous. The only reason I'm zoomed in is because of the lasso. Um, and then we can see exactly where this depression happens on this on this 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 fabric. We can see the depression. Let's just cut this off earlier. You can see the depression happening here where we have this object coming forward and this object suddenly being in front of this object casting a shadow. So this edge that I made kind of made the fabric behave a little differently because uh, I need to make this object cast an even further shadow down this way. That's okay, the demonstration is still intact. But do you see what I mean when I say the cross section or the edge? This also is referring to the edge. There's also a little bit of subsurface scattering, so this wouldn't be so dark, but that's that's not stuff you need to be worried about right now. <clears throat> Though I do need to do a class on subsurface scattering, because a lot of you have asked me about it. Okay. <clears throat> So I recently upgraded my um, internet speed to like extreme or something, I don't know what that means, but my download speed is really high, my upload speed is really high, so YouTube videos should be up much faster now than they used to be. Okay, so I'm just cleaning this up. This is a fold. Right, I can't make it too clean because I gotta continue the lesson. Fucking perfectionist. <laughs> All right. So that's kind of what I mean when I say the edge work. Now this is a cross section. This isn't how I feel like this fabric is way thicker than that. If we were to cut it in half, it would have a top side to it, something like this, where we see the top side because it's like a thick material. Uh, but uh, still, think about how the edge can, can really help you um, need to render less. An edge makes it very, uh, it makes it so that you have a full gauge of how far you need to really render with brushwork. Once you finish cleaning up the edge, it gives you a, an idea of what's left. So always consider the edge. Never leave, oh, I'll just clean up after. That's really bad. Everyone write that back at me. Don't leave cleaning up till after. Clean up as you go. I mean, it's okay to be messy early on. 
uh, with your core shadows and your fast brush movement um, and your brush work early on it's okay to be a little bit messy you'll clean that up later but I'm talking about the edge work get the edge work down earlier um, than you would normally because that ensures that you're going to be considering the object's texture on the edge level Give your work some edge. Is the light coming directly from the side? I think it's coming on an angle. I don't think, I think what this person's drawn is kind of not, like they wanted, God bless their hearts, to work with this one, but they eventually just worked with one that was way outside of the screen. So the one they worked with is like up here somewhere. So I don't know if you can see the size of my brush. You can probably. But it's like up here somewhere, shining down. It's not that close. If it was that close, it'd be like a candle. And candle flame is very sharp and very severe. All right, now for the secondary light source trouble that you were having. Um, most importantly, I think at this point is the the background color and what you're telling me about the object in comparison to the background color. So what I'm going to do is. I'm going to lighten the background color just like I did with my version. I feel like we're going to see a little bit more because the room is pretty bright. You see that? I don't know what it is, but it worked. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say I don't know what it is. Let me friggin' teach her. Um, but it's, it's the fact that we've uh, made the light dominant in the room, so the shadows have now a, a one direction where they're coming from instead of possibly... Um, two really close to each other light sources. So one is strong and the other one is slightly stronger instead of having, um, which is not a good thing to have. Always have one dominant light source. And when we lighten the background, what happens is that we have a dominant light source that's stronger and controls the room as well as the fabric. So the fabric feels like it's part of a room. Over here, the fabric feels like it's standalone. But when we make it um, involved in the background, it kind of just makes for a better environment, a light environment. Let me just try to get this so that we can... God damn it. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Damn. There we go. See, it feels like the, the fabric is in the room that shares the same light as what's on the fabric right now. And what that makes, what that creates, again, to repeat myself, is a light environment. That's nice when you're, when you're doing studies, but you also think, think about where is the study going to be used? Well, what, what is the study reflecting? How much can I really render with this study of mine? side here needs to be a little bit lighter because it's facing up with the light. You kind of just uh, shaded it off to the side, which is not a good idea. And if you want this fabric to feel like it's reflective, like shiny fabric, I'm going to use my burn tool for this, but please do not use burn tool if you don't know how to use it. It's just going to make a mess. Um, but I'm going to use burn tool. I'm going to start off with midtones. And I'm going to choose the highest spot on all of these elevations, and they're going to feel like they're really shiny. You know what this is at the end of the day? This is a texture study. At the end of the day, this is a, you know, just a basic study of one particular kind of texture. When you do rock textures, when you do mountain studies, um, they will not look like this. So they'll have their own unique form signatures. But right now what you're doing is a texture study. If you study this kind of form, you're studying fabric, you're studying, um, uh, how to render skin, how to render boobs. Um, tr trust me when I tell you, if you do fabric studies, you'll know how to render boobs. Just trust me on this. <clears throat> um, don't ask me why. Actually, ask me why, obviously. Um, you're just studying how to, basically shading cylinders is what you're doing. If you break it down to its most common geometry, or most basic ge geometric shape, um, it's, it's a cylinder. So if, you, if, if, of course, you don't want to be painting cylinders all day, you want to challenge yourself, you want to paint this kind of cylinder, um, which is like a fabric, fabric shape you're still learning how to draw boobs because boobs also are fabric wrapping around a core a core geometry. Um, you're studying also lightness of an object, so object's lightness, how light it feels, um, an object's weight. So when you study this, you study curtains, of course. You study um, how hair drapes <clears throat> and how hair falls. Uh, what else acts like fabric? Um, you'll be studying uh, 
it's not just I'm mean, just it's like the under in the umbrella of fabrics and how fabrics behave as a as a form. Anything that is similar to that, you're also going to be studying that indirectly. You're still doing work. And I feel like this little bit over here would overlap. Kind of like critiquing my own form study from before. But do you guys know what I mean? Like what else acts like fabric? Like hair that drapes. Anything that drapes, really, you're learning how to deal with it. You're teaching yourself, preparing yourself to, to know how to render it. I think that's awesome. I think that's really efficient studying. And that's kind of what, what influenced me to develop form studies. And not to invent them, but to think of them when, I'm, when I was trying to teach my friend. <clears throat> um, I was trying to make him study more efficiently. And I think that, that was the advice. That's how they started. I was like, try to study more efficiently. So don't study like a, a vase or a cup. Just study a cylinder in, an, in a light environment, in an open space. And that's kind of what led to all of this, really. Losing my voice. One sec. Um, does the midtone always match the ambient environment? What do you mean, Ren? Liquids, yeah. Uh, definitely liquids behave like that as well. Good job, Kenthian. That That's true. Um, your ambient environment matches the midtones represented in the image. Um, yeah, me too. Whenever I say One Direction, I always want to make a One Direction joke. <clears throat> but I don't want to give them that, that, that uh, acknowledgement. I don't know why. I just hate boy bands. Clean up. Uh, once tidy, always untidy. Once untidy, always untidy. Yes. Uh, clean up as you go, uh, or you'll get a messy home. Um, I saw Draken's remark, so I was wondering if it was a mistake or the rule. Midtones match the environment if it is the same material and color and value. Color value. Uh, midtones are a touchy subject. I should probably cover them up. I still haven't touched on <laughs> um, uh, secondary light sources because I had to change the background and then I changed a couple of other things and then I lost track of time. Um, Alright, so this is how we do the secondary light source basically. When you want to do secondary light sources, uh, the key is to make sure you have a good light environment. So that's why I had to make the background lighter. Where you had it before, there was no light environment. It was a dark room and a lamp really close to it, but the shadows weren't dark enough. So it was like you were trying to draw a lit room, but you had uh, the setup was a, like you brought the the sheet from a lit room into a dark room. This is dark. This is this right here. This is dark. All right. What we need to see is a light environment that represents a strong light source. So we need to see, we need to be up here somewhere. This is like this is like the godly place. This is this is lovely right here. If you're choosing any colors from here. I congratulate you. The only time you dip this low is if you need that kind of reassertion of the light's power over the image. But if the light is so strong in the room that it's made the background light, it does not allow shadows to go that dark if the object itself is a light object. But let's get on to secondary light sources. What I do is I crop my uh, opacity like 90% almost and I get the background color and I focus the light source, secondary light source, only on the grid, if you think about it, only on the part of the z-axis that faces the light source, that faces away from us and towards the z-axis, towards the bounce light. What does that mean? That means that if you mapped through over um, a chart, so you've got x and y, you're two-dimensional, and then you introduce the third dimension and everything goes bonkers. Um, Sometimes when I think about it, when we think about let there be light, you know, at that moment where everything was created, it's such an amazing metaphor, so sophisticated for the time in which the Bible was written, where like <clears throat> we say let there be light and everything was created, light would not be able to bounce around and travel if there wasn't a z-axis, so it was like saying let there be light, but but I'm, I'm not trying to <laughs> I'm not trying to lecture you guys on religion, but just I think about it sometimes. How sophisticated that let there be light and then everything was created. Of course, we see everything with light. Um, we wouldn't see anything, and um, the z-axis is needed there. So it was like everything was created and everything is three-dimensional. So you take it a step further, and then you're like the 3D world is visible to us because of light, and there needs to be a 3D world. Anyways, I'm done. <clears throat> 
This part here, if we think about lasers coming out of every single every single one of these, the base is like the skirt of this uh, of this fabric. We see like um, different trajectories or different directions that every single one of these square inch places faces. So we want to catch the ones that are directly inside the z-axis, that are on the z-axis. So if you throw another z-axis here, anything that faces the z-axis. This one faces it, of course, but it's got a cast shadow on it. This one faces, this is one that's on the z-axis um, as well. It's practically a drawn z-axis. And it's on the, uh, facing the light source, that's why it gets the light. So we want to find something that also goes away, goes inside, into the painting, into the depth of the image, but is facing away from the light. That's where we want to place secondary light source. If you're a photographer and you've lost a lot of the object that you're photographing and shadow, what you want to do is get a diffuse on the z-axis. Well, of course you know where the z-axis is because it's the real world. You just put it beside the object. So it's not in front. Light source, secondary light source, it's not helpful if it's in front because then it's just diffusing in a really bad way. It's diffusing the midtones. Everyone write this back to me. Soft, secondary light, secondary, forget the word soft, secondary light source always tries to defuse or should always try to defuse the shadow. Of course, you can't defuse a highlight, you're just making it stronger um, by, adding another, by adding another light beside this, the primary. So, this is where secondary light source goes it defuses shadows. When I release this app, it's coming out soon, when I release it, I'm going to be teaching you guys basically how to use it. And that's then one of the number one rules, is placing secondary, you're going to be like photographers in your own studio, placing the light source on the shadowed side. That's what's important. Um, theater mode, right beside the share button. Um, bats would disagree. Triple ball sack, I don't know. <laughs> Secondary light source um, should make that sweet diffusion happen. Absolutely. Um, secondary light sources diffuse coarse shadows, not midtones or highlights. You don't want to diffuse midtones or highlights because they're not really where the where the form is being drowned. Write this back at me. Form is drowned in shadows. It's also drowned in highlights. It's also drowned in highlights, but we're not talking about that. Um, this is why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing it all down. This is why we need... I wish I could teach in Dogue language. That would be so much fun. Secondary light source to revitalize that form so that we can see it. So where you place the light source, if the question was where do I place it, just like I said, place it on the z-axis or areas of great intense shadow. Place it on areas where you want some detail to be visible. If you feel like there's some really cool armor design that you want to show off on the side over here like some sort of stitches or um, or string or some sort of uh, emblem you're gonna have to bring in a secondary light source but remember that secondary light source um, illuminates everything so the side of the arm is gonna be illuminated if this whole area was shadow that is if the light source is coming over here place it in a strategic area that reveals the form and the forms texture um, so I would place it just along here. I just remembered there was a YouTube comment and this guy comes in and he's like this bitch takes too long to get to the point. <laughs> I deleted it. I don't know why. I thought it was so rude. But um, but I, I, I remembered it today and I was laughing so hard. I'm like this person comes out of nowhere and calls me a bitch. But they're so sassy. I just want to get to know them. <laughs> they just call me a bitch like this bitch. It was like so funny. I don't know why I found that funny. <clears throat> but I'm like, they're probably really fun to hang out with. Like, they don't give a rat's ass. <laughs> they're going to say what's on their mind. Yeah, the reason why I thought of that just now is because I'm taking too long to explain secondary light source. So over here. This is a bounce light as well. So this is bounced. It could have been from a secondary light source flame. It doesn't matter. This also gets its own little diffusion. And it happens right across the shadow. So you see that little belt that just that just dropped in there. That's what we want to see. We want to see the moment of separation. And here's the rub, boys and girls. Um, rub, boys and girls. <laughs> um, I think my medicine's kicking in. Uh, we, when we use the secondary light source and we bring in a secondary light source or to defuse some core shadows, 
what happens is I don't know what OC is doing. What happens is a clash. A clash between the primary light source's core shadow and the secondary light source. This clash runs across right over here. Let me get the darken. So it runs right across over here. And that's what's left over after you're done all the diffusions and all of the, the, the core shadows and all of the highlights. What you're left with is this. And this is many, many rules working together to make this fabric feel three-dimensional. And this clash right here, do you see it? La la la. This is what you find in really amazing paintings. This is what we don't look for and we, we don't really see it until we have a name for it. This clash right here, the core shadow of the primary and the diffuse of the secondary. What's left is this sexy little line that says, hey, I'm 3D and I'm proud of it. And that's what you guys have to remember using in your paintings. If you're using a painting on a, f what the hell, if you're painting a face, the diffuse usually sits around over here when you have a diffuse running across the um, the jawline. Like if you have a light source coming out of here, and then all your shadows for the nose <laughs> are running across here. Um, and you've got the core shadow running across over here. So this is where your core shadow is left over. And then you've got the eye socket. Um, what happens is a secondary light source comes in. And where this secondary light source runs across is it runs across the edge. So on a cylinder, it's really easy to paint this. But if you're painting cloth on a cube, this secondary light source is limited to the cube on which it, it the shape it, that it takes on the cube. Yeah, it's got moments of relief where the cloth is just um, clothing. And then you've got the skirts that we've learned how to render so far. And then you've got the, 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 the relief across here and the edge. Very, very important to remember the edge work. This secondary light source, if you see some of it on this object, it's limited here. It's not shared over here if it's only coming from the bottom. That cube gets in the way. Always think about where the z-axis is. It stops light. <clears throat> Basically, light is an unstoppable force and the only thing that stops it, I mean, you can put your hand over a lamp, yeah, but the, the, the light keeps emanating unless you turn off the source or something. But light in itself doesn't stop, it continues. Um, and what happens is that the only thing that can stop it, that can get in its way, is, is something that, that doesn't, that, that, something to interrupt it, which is the z-axis, depth. That's the only thing that'll get into its way, depth. And that's how we see objects. That's why I'm always saying when you're drawing, don't just memorize how an object looks. Remember, memorize how light acts on the object. Don't memorize the object, memorize how, memorize how light acts on the object. Please write that back to me, my babies. Okay, that sounded too, um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting high. <laughs> write that back to me, guys. <clears throat> Someone explain it, too. Someone else explain it in your own words. Memorize not an object, but, but light. Um, memorize not the object, but how light, um, no, memorize not the object, but light on that object, yeah, there we go. <coughs> it is stopped by anything solid, um, it is stopped by something that has depth, so something with the z-axis, that's the only thing that stops light. light just keeps running, it just keeps going. And when we have instruments such as eyes to translate what it's telling us, we see what the object, what light is revealing, which is the object. But what we don't see is what shadows are. That's what we don't see. That's what the light doesn't see. That's where there's minimal detail there, because there's no light there to feed our instrumental lead, our instrument eyes um, uh, information, so we don't see detail. That's why we don't put detail in shadows. There's no light to feed that information. The only thing that stops it is a z-axis, and that's where we find those beautiful little cast shadows. <clears throat> beautiful, Devin. Beautiful. Beautiful. Everyone, round of applause for Devin. Don't bother learning what an object looks like, because you won't even see the object if it weren't for the light source. 
learn how the light interacts with the object. And that's f efficient learning. If you learn how a light behaves with a cube, everything, everything that is cube-based, every object in the world that is cube-based, you will be able to draw it. Because you already experience the light and form signifiers, signatures on that cube. Everything. You'll be able to draw a castle, you'll be able to draw a shoe, you'll be able to draw anything. Learn how to draw a, 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 a sphere. Um, learn how to shade a polygon that has um, numerous edges in it and you'll learn how to draw, I don't know, I don't know. Learn how to draw a cylinder and you'll be able to draw arms and legs and, and swords and poles and, and, uh, and cars. Learn how to shade all of those objects simultaneously, complicate the objects a little bit. You'll eventually be able to learn everything because while you are studying these miniature objects, um, these miniature ge objects that have core raw geometry in them, you're, you're also studying, you're drawing everything else in the world. And you're experiencing light for, for its, in its raw state, and that means you're memorizing a lot more efficiently. <sighs> okay. <laughs> um, one clap. Hazuki gave him only one clap. Don't give a damn about objects and steal your classmates' notes. <laughs> Speaking of sausages, I am so hungry. Me too. I really want some Italian sausages right now. <laughs> that sounds so wrong. And cloth, the cloth in the picture um, is kind of uh, cylindrical. Cylindrical, yeah, it is. I feel like the one I drew um, in my version was like more cylindrical, but this one kind of just folds on itself, and then you've got the little pieces. So you've got shadow, light, shadow, light, shadow, light, shadow, light. I like I like your rendition though. I really like what you did here. So thank you for redoing it. Nice, great recap on the rules. I'm going to quickly, um, I can't look at any fabric studies because no one did any because you guys suck, I'm joking. <laughs> but I'm going to run over the same rules we just looked at but, uh, but on some form studies. Alright, so can anyone tell me what's wrong with this? Can anyone, can anyone see it? Does anybody see it? It's the Bracu Gourmet. <laughs> I do not like Italian guys, okay? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I applaud your taste for my country's cuisine. Um, the light comes from the top, but the cracks are too dark. Yes! Enthusiasm gets, um, gets, gets, gets the reward. I don't know what it is. But she gets it. He, she, it, lighten. The reason. Okay. Can anyone tell me why it's too dark? Right. So we found out that it's too dark. Can anyone tell me why? And Thu, you wanna, you wanna go for it? The, the light bounces around inside the cracks. Absolutely. That's one reason. Another reason is... What's the other reason? There is another reason. The light is coming from the top and as such the light would reach into the crevices. Beautiful. This entire area, this entire zone right here, so you guys don't need me, this entire zone is um, is the light half. It's, it's the light realm. It's the realm of light. It's heaven and this is hell. Okay, this is where the light is shining. You cannot, you cannot have a non-local shadow come into uh, an alien that's not local. <laughs> you can't have an alien shadow come in um, and have the shades that are not local. Meaning, there's only so dark you can go on this side before you've done something that feels like you actually got paint and painted it in. It won't feel it won't feel like it's really coming out of the the, the, the potential of these of this light area. So for you to have just said, okay, well, dark is dark and light is light. That's wrong because that means you're not thinking about a light environment. All your drawings will be dull. 
If you don't think about light environments, your drawings become dull. Dull drawings are, are directly linked to lack of light environment because there's nothing really deciding the rules, setting up really nice rules. Also, your edge, as you, as you speak it here, is telling a very different story about the behavior of the, the object's texture. So this is what I mean when I say this is how important the edge is, babies, listen to me. When I say the edge is important, I mean this. This edge is telling us about a point. It's telling the tale of a great point that happened on this cube. And yet we don't see one. We have to see one. And it has to correspond with the texture that you're rendering. If you, drew, if you painted softly, it means that this was soft. It was a soft edge. It was curved. It was, it was uh, curved at the edges. All right, we need to see this sharp edge that you're translating at the uh, on the actual edge of the image. So please don't forget massive little details like that. They're small, but they are massive in perspective because they change the behavior of the form completely. All right, now this is no longer aligned with that, so I have to realign it. So you see how amazing form studies are. They, they allow us to directly in, involve ourselves in the rules of light and physics and observable light and physics without having to draw like any, any one object, without having to draw a, a, uh, any, any raw object with a, with a name on it. We don't have to draw a teacup to experience these rules. We can just draw as, as the core shape over here as well. There needs to be some edges. Your edges tell a different story. You have to make sure you're using a brush that reinforces the texture you're trying to translate. Do not use a brush that undoes all your work. So using a soft brush for texture studies or, or form studies is a bad idea. I do not use soft brush for these things. Um, if you have ever looked at my texture studies uh, or form studies, you see that I use a very chiseled, textured, um, hard edge brush, which is very, very important. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> I blame you, Dayquil. I lost all dignity. <clears throat> all right, what else is wrong here? Can anyone else see it? Yeah, synonyms are great when talking to multi multilingual people. Just FOI to everyone in chat. We need to, just to be pro at pistols. Um, kind of, yes. Uh, you mean dulled? Sorry, my English fails. Weathered, of corners, if you don't understand. Like erosion. Weathered, yeah. Curved, weathered, exactly. Um, the shadow is extremely dark, yes. The only time this shadow will be this dark is if someone got paint and painted only this side dark. The only way in this light environment we would have this dark an object, if the object was the same color all around, except for this side. Got paint, threw that in there. You people overrate your use of darks, like you way overrate them, like you guys are crazy, like you're like, I have, I set up this color, I set up this color and this color, I'm going to use all three, I don't give a shit. And that's, that's the colors that I'm going to use. Um, that's not how it works, right? That's not how it works. Sometimes I use a margin of this color, a margin of this color, and stick to this color. Sometimes I use the most of this color, a margin of this color, and some of this color. I don't use the entire spectrum that I have chosen. I don't use all of it. I don't need to. If I can create enough form with a really nice clean edge, some clean edge work here, and some really well-placed um, highlights that, that are not blended, I will feel like I have reached a, re a read that, that does not need to be exaggerated any further. We still have an object that is white in color, gray in color, really friendly for you guys to use um, grayscale, not white objects, always paint objects that are in mid-grays because that'll translate later into your painting of faces and skin. But uh, but that's that's my two cents about that. <clears throat> All right, so everybody write that back at me. I don't know what I just like. I don't, I don't know how you're gonna summarize everything I said, but figure it out. <laughs> I need to give that. Did this to do an arm today? 
No, I didn't do an arm. Shadow of the edge hole is wrong. Yeah, now that we lit everything up, now that we threw all the other values up, this thing here just shows up its little mistake. And then this and this cannot have the same value. This little hole and this cannot have the same value. They are not exposed at equal levels to the light source. That is not how it is working. So this needs to go down. It needs to be diffused. Right. And this applies to everything else. If you were painting a black object, let's say this little diamond shape was a black object, was a dark grayish object, and you want it to look like it is really dark. So this is how it will act. It would go dark like this. Darken. Its dark tones will be much darker. They will not reach this level at all. They'll probably reach this level. And its mid-tones probably non-existent because you're just going to have different graduations of gray, of, of dark black gray. Sorry about the, the line of light in here. But this now looks like an onyx, I don't know, keystone or, or something that opens a lost empire. I don't know what you guys are going to be hired for later. God knows what kind of movies are coming up in the world. But you see what I'm saying? This is the only time that what you chose was right. <clears throat> see how important it is? Need to fix this. Da, 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 da. Mm -mm -mm. Life's good when you're not in pain. <laughs> you lost me. I'm lost forever. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to shut down. I took too much painkiller. <laughs> I just had all this headache, and I was like, oh, I'm going to class. I don't know why I'm telling you guys this. I think I've gone crazy. Right. So this is a black object. This is a light object. I mean, you know, like I am a genius, so with genius comes madness. So you're going you're gonna to have to deal with... <laughs> I'm joking. I'm not a genius. But yeah, madness. <clears throat> all right. Light object, environment, light environment, check. Values, check. Spectrum, check. Um, crazy is gone down. All right, no more crazy value jumps. You're suddenly we're like here, and we're strolling down the park, and suddenly we just got teleported to no man's land, out of nowhere. The only time this happens is if an outer force comes in and changes that object's color. It's the only time. Pigmentation, it's what it's called. But if the object is inherently pigmented, is dark already by nature, it will not have. You know, it's walking down the street, walking down the street, and then something suddenly, you know, throws it into no man's land again. But inversion. Um, that also cannot happen. So it's, it's, it's vice versa. Light objects can't suddenly become dark and dark objects can't suddenly become light because you said so and those are the colors you chose. You can change the colors you chose, by the way. They're not set in stone. Once you guys set up your palettes, I've noticed you guys just stick to them to the ends of the earth. Um, you don't need to do that. Uh, you, you, can, uh, you, can, you can edit them, you can cut this out, you can defuse this one. You're like, okay, I don't need to go that dark. Sometimes I don't feel like using dark shades even though I have to. That's, that's a stylistic and creative choice I make. Sometimes I'm just, I just completely cut this off and I'm saying, I'm skipping shadows today. As long as you have your edges intact um, and your rendering is intact, you will, you will not lose if you skip shadows in that way. I'm not saying you guys are ready to skip shadows. I'm just saying um, remember that shadows are overrated. As well as highlights. Stick to your grays. It'll create for a better read. And now that we change these, um, we can change these. No, it really feels like a light object, <clears throat> like a like some sort of I don't know. Dark objects painted dark, while objects while light objects painted light in the lit room, because drugs and art apparently do work. <laughs> no, it's it's night it's day quill. It's not drugs. It's not like narcotics or anything. It's it's just um. 
It's it's cold medicine. There's a million ways to get clean edges with any brush. Yeah, but you want a brush that you're not going to be sit, sitting there cleaning its mess for every two steps forward, take three steps back. Um, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that to yourself. That extends your your brush your painting time. No one wants to sit there for a week, and um, and it does not boost your line efficiency. You get a brush that 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 supports your intentions to use as little of your brush as possible. That sound that doesn't make sense. Sorry, <laughs> write this back at me. Um, find a brush that boosts your desire not to use your brush. Write it back. <clears throat> Big Pharma's got you fooled this time. <laughs> the Bermuda palette. <laughs> yeah, Bermuda Park. <laughs> uh, what parks do you walk in? I want to get teleported. <laughs> Beautiful. The best brush is the one needed the least. So you guys are so eloquent. And here I am just like stumbling around like a fucking monkey. Like an ape. The best brush is the one needed the least. That's beautiful. Find a brush that boosts your desire not to use your brush. That that supports. You know, like it, it, it's a brush that does the work. And it's like, hey, yo, I can do this for you. I can do it in two minutes. And then it does the job, and then and then you're you're like, hey, shit, that arm is just rendered just like that. I'm gonna stop working on this arm and go into the armor. I'm gonna go into the hair. I'm gonna go into the the, the blade. Um, find a brush that boosts your penis size. Uh, find a brush you don't use. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, you see this? You see this right here? Where? Come on, mouse. You really shut down on me now. <clears throat> see this right here? You see this? I just I just keep this just to feel good about myself. <laughs> to say, hey, well, I have a very large brush. Set, mine is larger than yours. But, um, but I don't really use all this shit. Uh, I use perspective brushes to feel good about myself. I don't use perspective brushes. And I rarely need to use them. The brushes that I use are from here, here, to about here to here. Those are the brushes that I use. And there are, some of them are my own of my own making. Some of them are are from random brush sets I found like 10 years ago from like this one artist that decided to release his brush sets. I, I, I couldn't for the life of me be able to find the names of them. <clears throat> I wanted to look at this real quick as well. You are ready, young Padawan, to jump into cast shadows. You can do it. I believe in you. And the cast shadow here would be sitting around this area right over here. Because that's the light ray shining in. And that's the vanishing point of the light ray. And that's this object A in front of object B casting its shadow. Um, because the light is pretty low. And this is the, the point right here. So what you're missing is this beautiful thing. Just look at it. It's just like, hey, I'm here and I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you make your drawings so much better. My name is Cash Shadow. A little bit over there. And we didn't need a reference for this for this, did we? No, because we just needed the rule. I just needed the rule. And you you can do this too. The other rule says that if you are on object B, does have a light environment of its own, the cast shadow just has to follow the immigration laws of that area, <clears throat> and you just you just have to diffuse it just a little bit. But that's it. Yeah, I, I already critiqued the fabric. I haven't critiqued all the fabrics, no, but I did critique one. A, the balls are back, <laughs> and the pair. <laughs> All right, do you see how wonderful these little cast shadows are? What they've done. Can anyone put it in words as a poet? Poet in a haiku. Can anyone put it in a haiku? What these cast shadows have just done to this form study, for this form study. I want a haiku.
Who lives in the New York area, by the way? Does anyone here live in New York City? Is the artist here? I would like to know what inspired the triple ball, <laughs> the ball form. Uh, I'll draw more fabric. Cast shadows make life. Cast shadows make life. Good. Cast shadows are for form. They enhance the shape and light. Use more cast shadows. <laughs> Beautiful, because I was just counting the, the syllables. <laughs> Beautiful job, Devin. Oh, man, you're wonderful. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Excellent work. Can't believe you guys actually brought out a haiku. <laughs> All right, I just need to darken and blur as needed. Sometimes when you don't know how to defuse it, just get a, a soft brush and just create like a glow. Because that's really what's happening. The light is bouncing back. Imagine light as a ball, as one of those little balls you used to get at the dentist's office <clears throat> after like they pulled out your fucking skull. And um, the ball bounces. It's really bouncy. And it bounces and breaks something, and you get beaten up with a sandal. You know those really thick like hedge sandals. You don't know. You know what I mean by hedge? Like the ones that people wear to to hedge pilgrimage. Those are really fucking thick ones that can take the desert. <laughs> that's what you get beaten with. Anyways, um, that's, that's pretty much what light is. It bounces back. The point of impact is where the glow happens. Because that's where we have most of the light meeting there. So sometimes to replace the defuse, excessive brush use in the defuse, um, all you really have to do is, uh, is just glow. And that'll, that'll defuse more than enough. I'm just going to cast that shot over here. <clears throat> Don't know what neighborhood you live in, Esther, but the parks and dentists sound pretty intense. <laughs> oh, yeah. And their sandals are pretty tough, too. <laughs> but when she says it, it just sounds wrong. I think it's because I'm a girl, and like I have like this, you know, like um, title as teacher, so people are not really okay with it when I swear. I'll try not to, because people recommend their kids to me, <laughs> but uh, it's hard not to swear. All right, um, everything else just is, is very, very well done. I really like these pairs. Remember that the pair is going to be a, a light green yellow color, so that means that what's going to happen is you need to lighten this way up for it to read like a pear. And pears are pretty reflective. So ask yourself, what really is the material? Yeah, the basic geometry, I get the basic geometry, but but remember the actual object itself. What kind of what kind of material does it have? It would actually be much more reflective than that and much lighter. I will see you guys next Tuesday. Uh, the 8th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Bye, guys.